thought about it. Like, no. I was like, do I have a paper? Because I don't think I do. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that, that scared me from Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like I did not. Oh, I had a slight technical issue with like the TED ad. I kept oh. trying to save the last question. Okay. But it just, I, I looked at it this morning and it never. It never saved. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for the heads up. We'll okay. see if other people had that, okay. that issue too. Okay. Yeah. Melanie is here. Gabby is here. Hi, Jake. Claudio is here. Hey, John. Okay, we've got 12.30, so why don't we get started? Good afternoon, s and The terrific response to the end of a very tough week. So congratulations on making it through your first full week of the semester, and this wasn't an easy one to make it through, but we got there. Just as a reminder, we're going to have another TED-Ed set of questions for Monday, and I enjoyed reading some of your responses. I haven't read all of them, but I saw that people were able to make contact with TED-Ed. The session for Monday, the TED-Ed questions for Monday, are going to be dealing with a similar kind of issue. It's a measurement-related issue. Now that we've introduced the notion of consciousness, we're going to begin trying to measure our sensations and our perceptions. And that's what today's TED-Ed was all about, this idea of signal detection theory. There's going to be another one that's a little bit similar, a little bit different for, for Monday. 
and that will be on understanding thresholds. So that's available out on Blackboard. I would normally project it, but this computer has been down all day. So we don't have a projection system today, but that's okay. We'll make the best of our, our conversation as we typically would. And the way I'd like to start out today is just by refreshing a little bit from our conversation on consciousness. So we had a chapter from this book by Dr. Nick Lane, who's a biochemist. And the, the book in its full title is called Life Ascending, The Ten Great Inventions of Evolution. And he has really neat ways of thinking about evolutionary inventions, so what evolution has given us. And there's the origin of life, there's DNA, uh, there's photosynthesis in there, there's also seeing is one of them, and consciousness was his second to last uh, of the ten great inventions that come to us by way of evolution. Interestingly enough, his last great invention is death. He, he describes death as a type of invention from, uh, from evolution. So we'll stay on consciousness just for a moment, and we'll, we'll try to remember where we were, so that I think will help us transition into how we might begin to measure our conscious experiences, our sensations, and our perceptions. So why don't we think about some of the, the big questions from last time around, and we'll see if you can uh, recall what kinds of answers uh, we came to. So you might remember that we started out with a question about a quote from Stephen Jay Gould, or a phrase from Stephen Jay Gould. This was an author, and uh, he was a person who was very interested in anthropology and also in zoology, and he occasionally makes an appearance on The Simpsons as a cartoon character, and he gave us NOMA. Can somebody just remind us what NOMA stood for? It's an acronym. Thanks, Alex. Uh, non-overlapping magisteria. Okay, no, that's exactly, yeah. So he kind of cheats a little bit there and he gets an MA out of magisteria, right? So non-overlapping magisteria. Can somebody remind us what, what those non-overlapping magisteria were? So yell them out if you remember, yeah. Science and religion, okay, right? And he believes them to be non-overlapping. He thinks that there wasn't a conflict. Then we had some conversation about whether there was a conflict or not, okay? Whether they're really overlapping or non-overlapping. How many people think that science and religion do, in fact, overlap, at least occasionally? They, they hold that view. How many people think they're, they're generally non-overlapping? They're really distinct, okay? They're, okay, you hold the view that they're, they're fairly distinct. Would you like to say a little bit about that, Sara? Okay, okay. So, so science is pure fact, and religion should be its its own its own entity. They certainly have different epistemologies. Who's that heard that word? We didn't use that the last time around. Epistemology. You've heard that word before. What does that mean for those of us who are familiar with epistemology? Anybody want to help us out with that? They have distinct epistemologies. Thanks. Okay. Okay. The study of knowledge. Okay. The nature of knowledge. How do you know what you know? Scientists tend to know what they know by making observation, making experiment, putting forth falsifiable, testable hypotheses, and religion is often faith-based. Another distinction that some people will make is that science is largely descriptive. It tries to describe the world as it is, and it looks for more and more accurate descriptions in a fact-based manner, as Sarah would say. Some people would argue that at least some religions are prescriptive. They tell us how we should act. Not the way that the world actually is, but the way that we should be. That might be a difference. But then others pointed out in our conversation the other day that we do have times at which these do overlap, right? And that we see a little bit of that in the Pope's response uh, to evolution in, as described by Nick Lane in this, in this book. Okay, so that was NOMA, and we can have a debate about whether we think we're overlapping or non-overlapping. I also wanted to get your general idea about a question we didn't mention the other day, just this notion about using evolution by natural selection, Darwinian evolution, as a framework for talking about consciousness. When, when we think about consciousness on a regular basis, or if we have conversations, and we don't often have conversations about consciousness itself, we don't always invoke evolution as an explanatory framework. Anybody want to share an idea about whether they think it's good or maybe not so helpful? Meg, was it? Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, you gave us an example of like research methods. I don't know why I remember it. Um, or maybe to remember you did, where someone who is conscious of a threat and like is like will run away and survive. Okay. Someone who is like unconscious or like not aware of the threat 
it doesn't get away. Okay. So, like, you can use your conscious ability to like perceive threats or danger. Okay. Sure. So certainly part of what consciousness informs us about environmental happenings, which might be threats, they might be opportunities for food or for mating or whatever the case might be. And so animals that are aware of those opportunities can differentially respond and have probably greater probabilities of re reproduction and survival and so forth. So it might make sense in that way. Okay. Something else? Some other ideas about using evolution as a framework for understanding consciousness? Yes, thank you. Um, since evolution is kind of like the, the structure and the foundation of biology, in some sense, you know, it comes as like a biological phenomenon mm -hmm. of the brain, okay. it should also be the structure for consciousness. Okay, okay. So that, that's a nice way of, of thinking about it. And that, it just, for those of you who might not have heard that, the idea was that um, the idea of evolution is, is very much a biological idea. And uh, certainly, consciousness relies on some biology. So if we, we think about, well, where does consciousness come from? Or where does the biology come from? So it, it actually does make sense to think about that in, a, in an almost historic way. Anybody have a rough idea of when Darwin published his his origins of species, right? Some of the first writings, approximately when was that? Uh, that's about right. Oh, oh, that's a really fun factoid. Thank you for saying 1830. So in December of 1831, a young Darwin about your age set off from England to go to the Galapagos right, on, the, on the Beagle to, be, to embark on his observations, not knowing at the time that he would later you know, come up with this tremendous theory. And so anybody know what else happened in 1831, December of 1831? that might be relevant to us here. Denison was founded on the, the same month that Charles Darwin, when he was your age, set off to, uh, to make some observations on the Beagle. Right? He didn't go off to, to develop a, uh, evidence in favor of his theory that he had preconceived. He made all these observations and he tries to put them all together. So what I think is very interesting about this and the point that Gabby is making is that maybe it really does make sense to have an evolutionary framework for understanding consciousness. We certainly are going to need to know something about the brain and in a few minutes we'll be talking about signal detection theory to help us understand how we can maybe make some measurements about the brain perhaps even if we are, if you will, only psychologists who are looking at behavior. We're going to use signal detection theory to draw some inference about biological phenomena. And this often is one of the nice things that psychology can offer to, to neuroscience. But it's really fascinating to think about a biological framework, an evolutionary framework for consciousness, and to think about the fact that philosophers have been grappling with the issue of consciousness for many, many centuries, maybe even thousands of years. I mean, the, the ancient Greeks were uh, are on record of dealing with these kinds of issues. Yet the ancient Greeks predate Darwin by a couple of thousand years, right? So some of the questions are really, really enduring, and you, you might wonder, gee, weren't they at a disadvantage in thinking about consciousness, given that they knew much, much less about biology? They, knew, they didn't have a framework that was an evolutionary framework, right? So they were operating at a disadvantage. They might have made some progress, but um, now that we have a framework and we have lots of measurement systems, we're, we're in a great, uh, greatly advantaged position. Okay, so now we know that we have axons firing, and we have um, we, we have uh, all these ions flowing back and forth, and that gives us consciousness. So, what was the hard problem of consciousness? Can somebody remind us? David Chalmers' hard problem. Tawny's got it. Yeah. Um, basically, just trying to like, find a way of like implementing the theory in school. Okay, right. So, how do we implement? feelings or emotion into this neural machinery, right, that, that we know is, is governed by ion channels and so forth. How do we do that? How do we go from firing to a feeling was a succinct way of putting that problem, right? How do we go there? And then there was this one other scientist, uh, Gerald Edelman, who's also a Nobel Prize winner, recently passed away, had an idea about, uh, about that problem, the problem of going from firing to a feeling. Anybody remember what his solution was? So it does seem like a problem. How do we go from firing to a feeling? So firing is something that we can, we can see the, uh, the uh, axon doing, uh, and uh, we can measure the changes in millivolt 
uh, lower volt levels inside of an uh, axon, and so we, we can we can be very biochemically precise about that. But we have to get up to a feeling. I'm looking around the room, and I see that Meg has her hand up. I see clearly there there were there was some firing going on in my occipital lobe that, that points me over to Meg. So, what did you, what did you like to say about that? Yeah. Okay, I can't tell from your response if you're referring to Edelman. It sounds like that was a, a good start on Edelman. There was, there was something you said about the reference to dust was almost a reference to panpsychism, that there, there might be unknown properties of, of physics. But Edelman didn't, didn't go that way. That was actually William James who was positing panpsychism. We didn't mention that one. And uh, I, I think most of us would agree William James is wrong on that one. <laughs> so, so anybody remember what Edelman's idea was? Yeah, clear. Okay, right, okay, right. An explosive does not resemble an explosion, right, okay. And so can you just unpack that for us? Um, so that's just because the neurons are firing and, like, ions are changing and everything, the action potentials are going through their um, opponents. It doesn't necessarily look, or we get feelings, but it doesn't necessarily resemble what brought us there. Like, okay, so okay. So it's, like, trying to make it a better picture to look at instead of, like, this difficult thing. Yeah, right. that's a nice way of putting it. He's trying to give us a better picture. He's trying to reframe the question, right? If, if there's something about the nature of that question, how do we go from firing to a feeling? The uh, assumption is that somehow there has to be a, a physical similarity between a cause and its effect. And as Claire is pointing out, Edelman says that an explosive does not resemble an explosion. Okay, you can do that either way. An explosion does not resemble an explosive. They don't look like each other. And we can generate example after example where there's no physical resemblance between, between the two. Um, some word that I throw out there, just because I, I'd like to make a contact to some of the things you might be doing in philosophy courses, for those of you who take philosophy courses. There's a reference in our book a few times to qualia. Okay? And qualia, it, well, maybe you can tell me, what are qualia? Does anybody recall from our reading? We didn't do that question yesterday. But yeah, thanks, Zach. Subjective experiences. Subjective experiences, right? Just, you know, we, we like some, some tastes better than other tastes. The, the fact that we can experience tastes and have some kind of valence associated with it, positive or negative, right, is, is qualia. And so that ties into this issue of how do we go from firing to a feeling. Well, it might be that the feelings actually are rooted in evolutionary processes, and maybe we don't have to have a physical similarity between the two. Okay. Just uh, by way of review again, uh, and this will also tie over in a few minutes to signal detection theory, Wolf Singer was another one of the researchers who was cited in Nick Lane's chapter, and he had this idea about neural synchrony. Okay? And we, we did a little demo yesterday, or two days ago, I guess it was, on neural synchrony. Can somebody remind us about neural synchrony and maybe our demo? Okay, yeah, thanks, Jess. Okay. Okay, right, so they become synchronized in their firing, and there's something about the nature of what's being synchronized with what that informs us about the real world. So we might get color information, which might be encoded in one set of neurons over here. We might get orientational information, one set of neurons over here. As you're watching me and you're listening to me, you're watching me basically by courtesy of your second, uh, your second cranial nerve. Okay, the optic nerve is the second uh, of many cranial nerves. These are all numbered. You're hearing my voice through your eighth cranial nerve. And yet somehow as you're watching me move my mouth, you're getting some visual stimulation from that. You're also getting some auditory stimulation. It all seems to be hanging together. But inside of your heads, those are coming in in very different places. Right? I mean, you, you already know that your, your ears are in a different location from your eyes. You may or may not know that uh, they make their, their, um, their transduction available to you by very different cranial nerves. Somehow, those have to come together. And Will Singer's thinking about that is there must be some kind of synchronized neural firing that there's some pattern of firing that might be rhythmic, roughly speaking, and there's going to be some 
coincidence of the rhythm on your eighth cranial nerve carrying my voice information and the rhythm on your second cranial nerve carrying the optical information about my mouth as it's moving. Okay, So binding those together uh, will give you some feeling of coherence out here in the world. And this is one of the ways that we can solve something like an infinity problem. There's almost infinitely many things we can see out here. We have a finite number of neurons, but we can mix and match uh, by using neural synchrony. Right? What was the idea there? Okay. Back to William James just for a moment. I mentioned him in, in passing. He held the view that consciousness is not an epiphenomenon. Okay? It was a question we didn't get to yesterday, but I thought we might mention it here. First, can we have anybody remind us what an epiphenomenon is? Maybe you learned about that phrase from another class. We didn't mention it yet in this class. But an epiphenomenon? Sometimes it's called a spandrel. Sometimes biologists call it a spandrel. Yeah, thanks. Something that exists on its own is, is a pretty good way of thinking about that. Can it, would you like to elaborate on that, or is that what you're going to... Oh, I was going to say that it's like kind of like a shadow of yeah. like a biological view. Okay. So like you don't really connect, you're just kind of different. Like, okay. Right, 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 right. okay. So, uh, some of the ways of thinking about the epic phenomena would be very much like thinking about a shadow. right? The, so why is it that we have a shadow? Well, we, I cast a shadow if light is coming from that particular region and it's casting a shadow behind me. Um, the shadow is an epiphenomenon. There isn't anything really over there that's shadow-like. It arises because it's riding on something else. It's riding on the coattails of, of some other phenomenon. So there's some basic phenomenon. You might think of the, the fact that light travels and the fact that I'm a mass. Those are actual phenomena. And we generate a uh, a very simple shadow just because of that effect. It's riding on that. As we'll see later on the semester, some people hold the view that our capacity to enjoy music is actually an epiphenomenon. Who's, has anybody heard of Steven Pinker? So you, you may have heard of Steven Pinker. Uh, he's a very famous psychologist, and he is somebody who studies language. He's a big fan of language. And toward the end of the semester, we'll be talking about how, evo uh, how evolution might have given us language and how we perceive language and so forth. He thinks that, uh, that music is auditory cheesecake. That's his, uh, <laughs> that's, that's his phrase. And the idea there is that, you know, why, is, why does cheese, cheesecake taste good? Well, probably we didn't evolve to taste cheesecake. We probably evolved for other reasons. But cheesecake has a lot going for it. It has some sugar in it. And sugar is good because that gives us carbohydrates. And carbohydrates are evolutionarily necessary to get some energy, right? It's got a lot of fat in it, okay? And fat's good because it's a long-term store of energy. So if we have detectors on our tongue that can pick up sweetness and fat, that's a good thing because those are evolutionarily necessary. So at some point in evolutionary history, some bakers get together. And after a long line of baking history, they put together cheesecake. And that basically pushes all of our evolutionary buttons. It just really, really makes us go, okay? So, uh, so getting back to language and epiphenomena, People like Pinker would say that, uh, that music is auditory cheesecake. What's really adapted for us is having speech and having language. And the fact that you and I can communicate with great, great precision about things that aren't anywhere near us. Okay? We, can, we can do that through language. And we can do that because our eighth cranial nerve carries lots of information that we can, uh, we can use. Okay? Once we have that in place, along come some folks that are equivalent to the authors, and they start basically pushing our buttons. They find that if you blow on this hollowed log, you can get a nice tone. If you bang on uh, a particular log in a rhythm, you get uh, a, nice rhythm, a nice pattern there, and you put those two together, and now it's kind of like having fat and having sugar at the same time. Right? You've got some rhythm, you've got some frequencies, and wow, is our auditory system tuned to that? You're pushing all our buttons. All of a sudden, we find music highly pleasurable. Music didn't have, according to Pinker, a original and uh, initial evolutionary purpose. It's riding on the coattails. It's the shadow of something else. Okay? It's the shadow of language, according to Pinker. So we can ask the question about whether consciousness is an epiphenomenon. Is it riding on the tails of something else? Right? It, it Maybe just the case that consciousness is something that we get sort of free of charge um, and it's, uh, it doesn't have a central value. Uh, anybody remember what William James said about that in our chapter? So, so, okay, thanks. Um, so I that it wasn't, I 
Okay, right, yeah, so now James has the good fortune of coming on the scene here in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and he knows all about Darwinian evolution because he's coming now a couple of decades later. So he's able to say, okay, maybe consciousness isn't an epiphenomenon, and that might have been a plausible way of thinking about consciousness a thousand years earlier before we knew about evolution and so forth. But now that we know about evolution and we, we understand something about the underlying biology of consciousness, he's saying, you know, it's really not the case that consciousness is an epiphenomena. It might be that consciousness is really about life or death. As Meg was pointing out earlier, if you can if you can pick up on where the food is, where the mates are, what to run away from, you know, that really has some evolutionary um, cachet. <laughs> okay. Okay, last question, then we'll move over to uh, signal detection theory. Jose Musaccio uh, talked to us about talked to us about this idea that we don't directly experience our actual potentials, right? We actually have to take out electrodes and we have to make measurements in the brains of other operating organisms or living organisms that are responding to the environment. We don't directly have access to our action potentials. Why not? According to Jose Musaccio. Any ideas? Okay, thanks, Alex. Doesn't he use an example like the, the we evolved to focus our brain power on the tiger hiding in the bushes rather okay. than that's right. That's right. I, mean, I find it intellectually interesting that we might know that minus 70 millivolts has one status for our, our neurons, and maybe um, minus 45 has a very different status. That's kind of intellectually interesting, but it's not going to save me when the tiger is coming to get me. Right? I just need to know where's the tiger, and so we're probably better off not knowing all those details. Right? Uh, I drive my car around everywhere. I actually don't know how my car works on many levels. I know how to turn it on. I know how to turn it off. If many things in my car broke, I wouldn't know how to fix it. Right? But actually, to be functional, I don't need to know. I don't need to be an auto mechanic. I don't need to um, know how to drive my car. It's probably good that we have auto mechanics. It's certainly good that we have more. We don't need really need neuroscientists in order to evolve and survive. Neuroscience came on board evolutionarily very, very late in the game. Right? We've been around as a species for something like 100,000 to 200,000 years, depending on when you want to think. Um, the human species as we currently know it started. Life's been around for like three billion years. And all this time we've not known about neuroscience, right? Uh, so we don't need to know. Um, and the consciousness or, or that activity is going on really without uh, our having a direct awareness of it. And that's just fine, right? It's, we, don't, we don't lose anything because of that. Okay. So with all of that, we set the start now for a pretty firmly biologically rooted idea about consciousness, and now it's time, because we are scientists, to start making some measurements. Okay, and there are a couple of ways that we can measure things. One approach to making measurement is called signal detection theory, and another approach is um, making threshold measures, and you were introduced to thresholds in the intro to psych. We'll be talking a lot about measuring thresholds on Monday after you view that video. We had a bunch of TED-Ed questions in uh, this particular session on signal detection theory. And I start out that video by talking about uh, a few issues, um, and I introduce two hypothetical young women who are Libby and Connie. Okay? Um, any idea about why Libby and Connie are, <laughs> are named the way they have? Okay, why don't, why don't we go with Madison? If that's okay. Um, well, Connie is third and seven. Okay. Okay, right, so one of the things that we're going to find out about signal detection theory is that we have something called a response bias that is separate and apart from our sensitivity to the environment, right, to the extent to which we're actually maybe even conscious of what's going on in the environment. We have response biases. Some people are inclined to say, yes, I see something. Some, uh, no, I don't. So Libby and Connie are two hypothetical um, participants, and they have identical sensitivities, but they have different response biases. Um, so can we just... Get some clarity on what does it mean to have a liberal response bias on, say, a detection experiment? Can we go with Alexa? Yeah. Um, it means that if you have a liberal response bias, you're more inclined to say that you do uh, see something if it's a visual study. Um, okay. If you, with less information. Okay, that's a nice way of putting it. So you're more inclined to say, yes, I see it with less information, right? And the information that we get is really these sensations, which of course are. are uh, riding on all this neural activity okay, that we now know about and we can measure, but certainly the inclination to say, yes, I see it in, if you will, a yes-no detection experiment. Right? So we can put up some very little things out of place.
vote yes or no, and the liberals, like Libby, are going to be inclined to say yes, I hear it. I can just make a connection to something that some of you had in Psych 100, and that's the only requirement for this course. Many of you have also had Psych 200. How many people have had Psych 200 here? If you've not, you shouldn't feel bad about that, okay? But in Psych 200, we talk about decision theory, and we talk about uh, the hypothesis testing, right? Do we reject the null hypothesis? Do we retain the null hypothesis? Who remembers talking about that in Psych 200? Who remember remembers talking about that in Psych 100? Rejecting or retaining the null It might depend on who you have, okay? So it's kind of the same idea. The null hypothesis here, that getting back to Psych 100 or 200, would be, you know, is, is there a signal there or not? It's kind of like when you're running an experiment, is there an effect, yes or no? So you're still in a yes or no situation either way. Is there an effect of having less the placebo? Okay, and if you say yes, you're making basically a liberal response. You might be running the risk of a false positive. Right, okay? Okay, so that's Libyan Khan. Okay, and we typically make these distinctions in signal detection theory in what we might call a type A experiment. So this is question number two in the TED Ed for today. So in the video I talk about what a type A experiment is. Anybody want to help us out with type A? Okay, why don't we go with Melanie? Thank you. When there's a correct or incorrect response, it's not like subjective at all. It's like either there was a stimulus or there wasn't, and yeah. the person responds either correctly or incorrectly. Okay, very good. And, and you might just make a note of this. Every once in a while, people who are less familiar with psychology will say, well, psychology is always about measuring subjective things. And they might not even say measuring. It's all, psychology is all very subjective. And it's certainly true that there is some subjectivity in the phenomena that we're interested in. Psychology is the science of behaviors, thoughts, and feelings. And sometimes our feelings and our thoughts are very, very subjective. Right? And, uh, and, and sometimes they're, they're driven by biologically rooted um, desires you know, to, to get food or to get uh, sleep or to get water, whatever the case might be. But other times in psychology, we're measuring things that are objectively knowable. And these, this is what's going on in a type A experiment. Can we get some novel examples of type A experiments? So that question asks us to make the distinction, and Melanie made it perfectly. You know, they're correct or incorrect answers. We can randomize the sequence. Side note on that, many of the people who are in my field actually run themselves in their own experiments uh, if you're trying to detect your own, uh, your own thresholds. I can, I can write a computer program that can put up a very, very faint amount of light on the screen or no, no additional light at all. Okay? And trial over trial, I can get very little light or no light. And I can have the computer randomize those. I can try them to myself. But because they're random, and because there's correct or incorrect answers, I'm not a no better off than you are than if I'm the one who wrote that program. <laughs> okay? All I've got on any given trial is my sensory system. Right? That's all I have to work with, and that's all you have to work with. So the fact that I wrote the program doesn't privilege me in any particular way. So a lot of folks who study S&P actually run themselves on their own type A experiments, and there's really no scientific reason not to. Okay? So can we get some examples of type A experiments? Meg's got some. Okay. Okay, right, so you hear it or you don't, it's a, it's a binary response, and most of these type A experiments are binary. You could have a four-part response that's also correct, so it'll still be type A, but these are binary. I can pick up on that. How many of us have done those hearing tests where you've got, and, and usually you raise this hand or that hand depending on which ear it is. So what's interesting about that, it's kind of like what we might describe as a detection test. Uh, somebody might also say it's an identification task because you do have to identify you know, the location of this thing. But you can, uh, you can get a D prime for each ear separately if you, were, if you were so inclined. Some other examples of type A experiments? Hoping we can get very, very different and diverse examples. The hearing test is a good one. throw one out there, just to, just to uh, on our final S&P realm, maybe as we go on we'll get further and further away from S&P. How many people in the room believe that they could actually distinguish Coke from Pepsi? <laughs> okay, not all of us can, but some, some of us are okay. For those of you who can, right, um, do you want to try to describe how, how you... <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, Pepsi actually has more sugar than Coke. Okay. Uh, so you can tell 
just based on the sweetness of the drink. Okay. Okay, so we, we do we might need to taste something and then use some long term memory about what is the average level of, of sweetness for one of these and we find which one is the better match. Okay, but there can be correct or incorrect ma- answers there, right? You can have a you can make your two alternative force choice tasks be Coke and Pepsi. Okay, and you're just trying to figure out which one it is that you're you're sampling at this time. Others uh, like me, I'm not a, a regular cola drinker, so I'm not a <laughs> Very central there. Uh, let's go with, I haven't heard most recently, I think, from Liz. Um, the cash style is when there's a cow bound with no stimulants present. Okay. So that um, the, so the experimenters can call it the participants are uh, sensitive or they're not sensitive. Okay. Okay. So they report that there's Yeah, it's very much a control, okay, and science is always about this control, because you could imagine that you can just play fainter and fainter and fainter sounds, right, and then ask somebody, do you hear this? And you can get somebody like Libby, or hypothetical Libby, who will tell you each time, yeah, I hear that, right, <laughs> I hear that, I hear that, and maybe she's got great, great hearing, or maybe she just has a yes response bias, okay? So we can actually have a quantification of how many false alarm opportunities we have, how many catch trials we have, and we can ask this almost conditional statement, what's the probability of a yes, I I hear it response given that we know that we put up a catch trial. Okay? And for those of us who are in the corresponding course uh, on the, the research side, we had something of a catch trial in some of the demos that we ran the other day on our um, study. Okay, so that's the idea of, of a catch trial. Okay, can you identify the two different kinds of errors that signal detection theory classifies? I've kind of alluded to them. Claudio's got them. Yeah. Uh, there's false alarm and a miss. Okay, a false alarm and a miss. Okay, real good. Can you unpack some of that for us? Yeah, so Okay, and if I, can, if I can interrupt you just for a moment there. So the way I think it's most intuitive, you're in your dorm at some point, and you're thinking of smell smoke. Okay, you're thinking of smell smoke, and you're saying to yourself, I'm getting a smoke sensation here, and maybe I shouldn't pull the fire alarm, but if I don't pull the fire alarm, then maybe that smoke is going to uh, get bigger, and the, the fire will get bigger, and somebody might die. So I'm going to pull the fire alarm, when in fact there is no fire, that would be a false alarm. Who's following that? So, okay, so we, we believe there's a stimulus there, but in fact there isn't. Okay, and I interrupted you. Then the other one was a miss, right? Uh, right? Yeah, the miss would be that uh, there is no stimulus. Reporting that the stimulus is absent. Uh huh. Okay, very good. And the one that's about the spectrum and the spectrum is that the Shot to get it, right? And if you didn't get it, then we go on to, you know, it's going to happen the next day. So it's really cool that people have clearly watched the video and, and done some readings on this and you've got the, the questions ready to go. I mean, it, it's just much more fun for me to have you interacting like you've got. Okay? All right. Um, so the two different uh, types of correct responses that we can, so we have the two different kinds of calls that Carlo gave us, two different kinds of correct responses. Let's, let's call them out. A hit? and a correct rejection, okay? So those are the uh, other possibilities, and then we typically get the um, stimulus response matrix. Okay, because our system is down, we're not able to go to draw two, but I usually like to project draw two, and just go to random students and see what they were able to, to draw there. So I wonder, could we get a couple of uh, volunteers to come on up and draw us a stimulus response matrix? Uh, and we can have two or three people going at once so nobody feels on the spot. If you would just come on up, no, that's great, and grab some chalk, and put a stimulus response matrix on the board for us. Anybody else want to do that? Yeah, thank you, Sora. Maybe we can get a third person. We can have one over there and two on this side. 
Madison? Yeah, thank you. Okay. So just grab some chalk anywhere. And we'll, we'll get a couple of stimulus response matrices going. What I think is genius about the stimulus response matrix, while we're having our, our friends put these up, is that this is a, a very simple mechanism, very simple to understand. And it's a way of converting simple behavior that you and I can observe, even with our just the naked pupil. We don't need any additional apparatus. We can exactly here we'll put it into this matrix and make some pretty fine guesses about what's going on at the biological level. Okay? So it's an interesting case where behavior can inform us about biology through signal detection theory. While they're doing that, can we get a feel, too, from the folks in the room? Uh, how did you experience, for those of you who did use Draw2, I hadn't gone through everybody's responses, for those of you who did do Draw2, what were your experiences like with Draw2? Go ahead, Alex. Kind of like a perfectionist nightmare. <laughs> okay. You can't get the words in the right place. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. So we're all going to have a practice effect. And I, I assure you, I will grade very, to the extent that we have grades on these things, I'll grade very leniently. I will also assure you that my handwriting is way worse than yours. Okay, so when I go to draw and draw to, um, mine's going to be worse than yours will be. Um, so, okay, so it's a perfectionist nightmare. Some other ideas about draw to? Some other... You know, I, yeah. you know what? You know what? Somebody, Gabby, in our other class, somebody did it, somebody and I, it somebody, yeah, and I don't. Either they did that, or they individually put up. They put the word frequency there. They put like an F and an R, and okay, maybe they spelled it out that way. But I was going to ask, and if we find really cool draw two tricks, please share them with the rest of us. Okay, uh, as I might have mentioned, I only learned about draw two a few days before the semester started. I think I was on my jog, and I ran into an IT person. I said, you know, I would love for my students to be able to draw stimulus response matrices and show them to me, right, or, or draw the signal detection for me, but I can't get them to draw through TED-Ed. I said, oh, use draw to, okay? So